Welcome. I'm Jim Persley, president here at Hinge Health. And today we have an exciting new episode of Pain Points, an ongoing series where I'm joined by leaders, experts, and practitioners from industry and academia to explore topics at the intersection of healthcare, technology, and innovation. In this episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Paul Kruchevsky, the vice president of deep technology here at Hinge Health. Paul, Thank you for joining Pain Points today. I've been really looking forward to this episode. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but you are the first Hinge colleague to be a guest on Pain Points, which um, you also may not know is, is a serious honor. And um, I feel honored. <laughs> in all seriousness, you, know, you and I have had uh, quite a few conversations about what we consider deep tech here at Hinge, things like computer vision and AI, and how these technologies are going to transform and enable a new level of personalized care. And I've got to believe that our Pain Points listeners are really interested in today's conversation. So welcome. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's nice to reconnect with you in the metaverse as, as, as we are. Yeah, maybe you could start off, Paul, by just giving the audience uh, a little bit about yourself, a little background. Yeah, so uh, I'm based in Montreal, and uh, I've been basically building technology for the last 45 years, ever since I was 10 and I started programming. I've uh, just fell in love with programming right from the get-go. Uh, what I really like doing is I remember writing my first video game. That was cool. Then I wrote a simulator to do physics, and then I started doing all those things. PhD was in math and computer science and simulation. Since then, uh, I built three AI companies, all focused on simulating humans in one way or another with applications in military, special effects, video games. Uh, and the last company, uh, Wrench, uh, which was acquired by Hinge, we were focusing on computer vision, really digitizing, using AI to digitize uh, humans. Fantastic. Well, given the diversity and uh, interesting background that you've, you've had, I suspect that we may get some questions from the audience. So I would encourage... Uh, our audience, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will do our very best to answer as many of them uh, as we can. Um, but kind of dig it in here, Paul. You know, I know there's two specific technology trends uh, that you've that you're really excited about and are very germane to the work that we're doing here at Hinge. Um, these technology innovations are going to make uh, healthcare more personalized, effective, and maybe even more fun. Um, why don't we start with this idea of a digital twin? Uh, I'm guessing a lot of folks who are listening today may not be familiar with this concept. Can you get everybody up to speed on what a digital twin is? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, it's like a lot of things. Um, this stuff exists, but you may not know the terms, right? So I think the best way to think about digital twins, if you go back uh, to 1970 and the Apollo 13 mission. So if you don't remember that because you weren't alive or you just don't remember it, you might remember the, the movie with Tom Hanks, right? And what happened during that mission, they're going off to the, off, off to the moon, and about 50, 50 uh, hours into the mission, there was a, a, a massive failure uh, of, of a certain subsystem. And what, what they did was, because the Apollo 13 astronauts were trained on, on a simulator that was a digital twin of the actual uh, rocket system, the engineers down in Mission Control were able to re, uh, repurpose the simulation, write a new simulation, and figure out how to solve the problem on Earth. And once they proved on the simulation, then they told the astronauts, hey, do this, this, and that. And the astronauts did that in the real world and, in the, and basically saved the mission. So the notion of a digital twin, it's a digital replica of something in the real world, but the goal of that digital replica is that we can start to do simulations so we can test uh, things because it's safer to test in the, in, in the digital world than in, in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Apollo 13 is a, it's an incredible story. It also happens to be a fantastic movie. Um, and I think that example does help demonstrate the impact that digital twin technology could have kind of bringing it closer to home. How do you see this playing out in uh, areas like physical therapy and in MSK mm -hmm. care more broadly? So because we're, we're providing digital PT and di digital MSK, what, what do we want? If we could have a perfect model of you, Jim, okay? So from an MSK perspective, right? There's so many ways to model the human being, the mental model, the emotional model, so on and so forth. But, but just, just imagine we had a perfect model of Jim from an MSK perspective. 
that that could just open up such a crazy world of possibility, right? And so you might say, okay, Paul, that's way out there. But I'll actually back up and say, no, it's not way out there. What we are doing today with our sensors and our computer vision is when you're using the app today, right? We're digitizing your movement uh, so that we can help you through the exercises. And that digitizing your movement is fundamentally building a digital twin of your skeleton, okay? So imagine we have a more complete digital twin and I'll, I'll stop and let people digest that for a sec. Okay, so it, it's gonna provide a level of personalization uh, because it's gonna be the digitization of our personal being, uh, of our you, of me. Um, you know, and it's, uh, I think, you know, I was talking to a colleague who's a big golfer. I, I am not a, uh, a great golfer, but talking to one of our colleagues who's a great golfer and, you know, he, he kind of compared it to the, the evolution in swing technology, looking at, you know, wearing a sensor on your elbow or on your shoulder and doing a golf swing versus being able to digitize the human body and look at swing analysis and everything from your feet to your hips, to your head, you know, to, to your arms. Um, really a, a big evolution and a major step forward in, in how we, but that's, you know, that's golf technology. You know, how do you, you know, how realistic or how close to reality is this for us in MSK in physical therapy? Uh, yeah. what, what kind of timeline do you envision? So I think from a, from a movement perspective, from a actually tracking your skeleton, I think we're there, right? I mean, like, uh, like in the sense of, I I'm very in the future. So I think we're now, now, like it's this year, next year, and that's sort of so, but I, but I want to invite you into a world where we have way more than just your skeleton and we start building out your whole body. So let's say we have your actual, your actual body, right? So we can scan you in clothes or maybe some kind of like leotard or something. Then we have your surface. We're going to know your complete morphology. We'll eventually be able to actually, and I think that's within two or three years from now. And then I think eventually we're going to be able to like imagine a bunch of sensor fusion. So we have your skeleton already, we get your shape. And then if you permit us, you know, let's say you share your body composition, right? You're like I'm 14% body fat and like I weigh 58 kilos or whatever. From that, we can actually reconstruct your muscles. And now the fun starts. We could start doing all kinds of simulations on you to simulate what you could look like if you do the exercises and I'll, and I'll uh, to the golf, I could actually give a very good example. Cause I think golf is, uh, is, is a great example. Let's say you're golf, not I'm, I'm not, but like your friend, right. And you know, I, I, I foresee very soon with, with the app, you'll be able to like do some swings, all sensorless. Right. And you could say, you know what, I've got a pain here or, or pain there. Well, we're going to be able to analyze that, just analyze you moving those things and generate a, a playlist that that could help you do that. But more cool, I think, or at least cool from a from a techno perspective is, you know, I think we all acknowledge that it's hard to stay motivated. But if you stay motivated, you're going to hit you're going to hit your goal. So I see a world where not only can we digitize you and understand what's wrong with your, your, you know, how we can help you play better golf from a, from a physio perspective, but we can actually show you a movie using generative AI. We can show you a movie of Jim, but better Jim, Jim do after he's done hinge health, this is what he's going to look like golfing. And once we have that, we can put you anywhere, Jim, we can put you where name your favorite course, you know? So just think of that from a motivational perspective. Yeah. I, yeah, I like this idea of better gym as long as they don't have to wear a leotard. Um, I think, uh, I, as long, <laughs> I don't know. If I think, yeah, I think tight fitting clothes, I think would be better. Okay. For right now. But yeah, yeah. I, I feel you. Yeah. hundred oh, well, percent. Uh, really all kidding aside, really exciting. Um, as you think about, uh, these trends, I think the next big one that you had, you know, have on your, uh, on your whiteboard is this idea of 3d avatars. Um, and, uh, we probably have lots of different perceptions on what that is, but maybe you could tell us, uh, Paul, what is a 3D avatar and how should we think about these? Yeah, I mean, I think so avatars, um, you know, maybe you've seen the movie, right? That's a, sort of a big thing where in that case, right, that was an avatar. Those those avatars were be humans controlling, you know, mechanical robots in this other world. But mostly where the word avatar comes from is this notion of, you know, there's something on the screen, like a video game character, 
and there's something controlling behind. So there's two ways to control an avatar, right? So the avatar is that 3D representation. So like, you know, Luigi the plumber, if you're playing a Nintendo game, there's either you as a player through your controller are controlling that avatar or the AI is controlling that avatar, right? So it's, it's a way to sort of how I'm looking at what 3D avatars are going to be. It's a way to humanize all these AI systems, right? Mm. Like already people are starting to work with audio based uh, avatars. So when you talk to Siri or Alexa, you're not talking to anybody, right? You're using your voice and your voice goes to the speaker. Then the speaker does AI that does voice to text. Then the text goes to a chat bot and then the chat bot cranks and then sends it back. And then there's text to voice. And that's what you hear as Alexa or Siri. Uh, and that's a much more natural way to look at it. But Again, talking is only one modality, right? We're having an audio visual experience right now, but more important, and I think really because we're an MSK, we are 3D creatures, right? Uh, we're about movement, literally. We're not about voice, we're not about video, we're about getting people to move better. So I believe it's critical, not only do we build digital twins of the members, but we want 3D avatars to interact with the digital twins. So you can think, I, I think of this as sort of like the mother of all interfaces, if you will. And I'll get yeah. into that a little bit longer. It, it feels like it's a, it's a more um, natural way for humans to interact with AI is kind of a way to think about 3D avatars. Uh, so it's, it's bringing a bit of humanity uh, to this concept of AI. And, and if, 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 that, if, if that's a, an accurate characterization, mm -hmm. how do you think yeah. that um, will play out in healthcare specifically? So I think, I think, you know, we were talking about this at the movement conference or, or you and Dan were really about like, how do you bend the cost curve uh, in healthcare? And also I think, how do you help prevent burnout, right? For healthcare providers. So I think there's, I, I think people get into healthcare because they want to help people and they want to spend time with people. And we're, we collectively have built a world where there's a lot of drudgery as far as I can tell of like, there's like people have to file reports and do all these things where they don't get to spend time with the patient or the member. And so I think avatars powered by AI in the background will sort of allow us to get rid of that 80% of the job that people don't enjoy uh, so that they can focus on the 20%. So maybe more to our, our place, you know, you could think of it as in terms of assessments and, and intakes it, I think it would be imagine a world where with the avatar and I can walk into the use case a bit before, you know, ra rather than having to go through having our people have to go through the sort of mechanical stuff, the avatar can handle all that. So then when it's time for the health, the human health team member to meet the member, everything's spooled up and, and they can get right to really what's, how can we help that member, if you will? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it's it feels like almost the democratization of 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 healthcare services. You know, whether it's a radiology image being read by uh, sophisticated AI that gives you know millions of people access to the best yeah. overeating in the world, or whether it's giving anybody anywhere, whether in rural America, the inner city, or anywhere in between, uh, you know, immediate access to some of those same uh, basic but important services that whether it was cost or affordability or access, you know, preventing. So this is really um, in many ways, the democratization of, of personalized care. Um, yeah. You know, I, I guess I'll ask the same question I asked before on the digital twins. You know, how far off do you think we are from from realizing that vision? Uh, I mean, I think I think I think we're really close, and and we've actually been having a really a lot of fun in Montreal at the lab in Montreal. So I would say when it comes to three D avatars, uh, you know, three D characters and games exist, uh, and so I, I think we'll start to see this in, in, in uh, I, I would say, uh, next year. I wouldn't say full launched out, but I think you'll start to see it maybe in, in you know, kiosks and stuff. I think you'll start to see interactions with kiosks next year. And I would say two to three years, I think it's going to be online. I think that, it, it depends on how fast I think the gotchas 
for real democratization are, are not in our hands of like how fast will 5G get there? And, uh, uh, you know, will, will Americans have access, you know, to, to 5G? We're, but I know I spoke about this at Movement a couple months ago and I thought it was five. But honestly, I, I think it's way, way closer than even I thought. So, hmm. yeah, and, uh, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see the next couple of months, the next couple of years. Um, quick question from uh, one of our audience members. Um, the question is: Could this truly replace? I think this being uh, digital twins, maybe not avatars. Uh, yeah. Could digital twins truly replace human patients during clinical trials, enabling the acceleration of go-to-market, you know, drug development for new solutions? What are your thoughts on digital twins being used for uh, drug development and clinical trials? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And I, and I think it, it, it's all about level of detail and, and, and specificity. So it's on a case by case. But I think I, I think human trials will still always exist. Right. I mean, because or for a long time, human trials are going to exist. But on the other hand, you know, I, again, sort of like getting rid of 80 80 percent of the drudgery i think we can get through a lot of, of drudgery so uh i i i i think i think this will totally happen i think again it'll knock off 80 percent. getting rid of 80 percent of anything is really easy getting the last 20 percent is just brutal so getting rid of that first 20 100 so so some of the the mechanics maybe some of the lower uh, value uh, elements of a clinical trial, uh, yeah. screening and and um, recruitment and some of those things could be uh, could be vastly accelerated. But you think that for the foreseeable future, there's always going to be a need to uh, to have uh, real people in the clinical trial. I I believe so, just for safety, because like how do how do we really really? I, and I love computers. Spent forty five years building stuff, but I mean like yeah. you know it's, it's sort of like autonomous vehicles. Right. Like so right now when we're training autonomous vehicles, the first thing you do is you actually train the autonomous vehicle in a simulator. OK, like basically a massive Grand Theft Auto simulator. But you want the autonomous vehicle to drive in the real world. So it's a, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't think Grand Theft Auto uh, would uh, would ever come up on pain points. But sure enough. Um, there you go. You know, it's, uh, it's really fascinating to think about how these technology uh, innovations can help us live better, healthier lives and give us a better understanding of ourselves uh, and our members. Um, it does invariably raise some questions though, around privacy and trust. You know, we, we recognize that our members are trusting us with their, their health, their personal information, and we take that responsibility of protecting their privacy really seriously here at Hinge. Um, as we strive to request only the necessary information and deliver the appropriate care, um, how do we? How do you think about that trade-off, Dr. Paul, between um, you know privacy and prediction, between um, the ability to deliver uh, innovative care and yeah, and that trade-off between um, yeah, I guess privacy and prediction. Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, that was I, I've never worked in health before uh, working at Hinge. And I'm Canadian, so our systems are slightly different. But I was um, very impressed with just how serious um, Hinge took things. I learned about HIPAA. We have like trainings. We all have to go through trainings. And, you know, it was really, really educational. So already in the, in the digital world, right, there's a lot of trade-offs between convenience and privacy and customization and privacy. Like Netflix, right? You're... You, you know, you watch Netflix and if you enable, you know, to share with Netflix what you're watching, you're going to get more of what you want to watch. So, you know, uh, and, and same thing with Spotify and everything. But I mean, obviously health is, is way more serious, right, than my entertainment of watching documentaries and stuff. So I think I, I think we have a lot. I think I, I'm really happy what we're doing. But it's just like when we talk, when you go to your doctor or your healthcare provider, there's a level of trust that you know that that will be kept and it's private. So I, I think we have to bake in the same kind of trust in all of our, we're doing that on a digital level, but on the AI level, we have to bake in that this is truly, truly private uh, yeah. because we want, I mean, me as a, as a user of Hinge Health, I want to share with my care team all of my details, but I want to, you know, make feel good. And I, and I think that was the one of the things we didn't talk about is I think it's also about trust. It's super important that our members know when they're talking to an AI and when they're talking to a human, because for sure, within five years, uh, 
avatars could be photorealistic that you wouldn't know. So that's why I'm really pushing us to make sure that when we build these avatars, when we build these interactions with our AI systems, it's really, it's crystal clear to the member, ah, this is a, this is a bot, you know, uh, so that we can maintain that trust. Yeah. Yeah. I think that level of transparency is, is really important. And like you said, I think if we as an industry, not just hinge operate with the premise that digital interactions should be treated from a HIPAA perspective, you know, in very similar ways to, if not identical ways to in-person interactions, I think we can, you know, I think we can maintain that level of, uh, of privacy and protection in a, in a new digital world. And, um, and, and to your point, knowing when you're talking to Jarvis, uh, versus uh, a real person, I think is uh, is an important is an important element of that. So, um, as we get ready to wrap up here, uh, again, I would encourage the audience if there's uh, additional questions uh, they want to take. We're just about out of time here, um, but we could try to sneak in another question or two if there are any. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground, uh, Paul, in a short period of time. You know, we've talked about digital twins and this virtual model of a physical entity. And there's going to come a day when maybe we can use these, or we are using these today, um, in some some initial ways uh, to simulate uh, human motion, to improve physical therapy uh, in real time, to create a level of personalization uh, previously impossible uh, before. And we're seeing that uh, today come to fruition in, in the next couple of years. 3D avatars, digital personas, this intelligent entity in a digital world that can really uh, streamline those interactions so people caregivers can deliver uh, and do what they love, which is, is to interact with the member, not do paperwork, not do intake forms, um, not do some of those kind of low level uh, tasks. Um, I think that's really, from my perspective, what's exciting is that this idea that if we do our job well, if we can apply these technologies uh, appropriately, we're going to promote humanity. AI is not here to, to replace people. It's to make people, those clinicians, your PT, your physician, your health coach, more effective, more powerful. Um, and to uh, hopefully deliver, uh, you know, magic moments to our members. I think about the uh, science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. He once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable for magic. You know, Dr. Paul, I think if you do your job well, if, you, if your team does your job well, if we do our jobs well at Hinge, we can create magical experiences for our members. And so thank you for taking some time. Uh, with us today. Um, everybody, this is again, Dr. Paul Krushevsky, uh, Vice President of Deep Technology here at Hinge Health. Uh, and to our audience, thank you uh, for joining us today, either live or later. Um, until next time, I'm your host, Jim Persley, and we'll see you next time on the next episode of Pain Points. 